Okay, we want to take a look at Pareto charting. Um, pioneered by Velfredo Pareto. I know his name is harder to say than the uh, concept is. Uh, born, you don't need to remember this, but born about 20 years after the American Civil War, lived up until 1923. Engineer, economist, uh, you know, what he created was what's often referred to as the Pareto Principle. And the Pareto Principle simply means we want to highlight the most important among a set of factors, um, sometimes referred to as the 80-20 rule. Um, Duran often referred to this as the significant few and the trivial many. Uh, the 80% 80-20 rule, and what you'll find, in it, it's, I've always found it to be amazing how, how consistent this is. Talk to a person in production, or if you're in there yourself, you'll know that 80% of your problems occur from 20% of your processes. Talk to somebody at, at a company about um, employee absenteeism, and you're going to find that 80% of the absences are generated by 20% of the employees. Talk to a school teacher, you'll find the same thing in terms of absences. 80% of their absences are probably generated by 20% of their pupils. Uh, it, it seems to be uh, a pretty common situation. Now, granted, 80-20 is a rough number. It could be, you know, 70-30, but it, it always seems to be back to, I think that, I think Duran reset it best, the significant few and the trivial many. And what we want to do is when we're trying to solve quality issues, we want to identify what those significant few are, because that's where our attention needs to go. So, the Pareto is a com combination chart. It as a chart that has a bar as well as a line, and the line is referred to as the Pareto line. Now, let me quickly show you how to get to these. Um, before I continue, um, on Blackboard, you actually have a uh, copy of Sharon's shirts completely done, uh, and you have a copy of Dr. Moore's uh, survey completely done, so I'm going to talk about those a little bit. You'll be able to see the whole thing if you bring up that um, PDF that has the uh, the entire uh, chart in it. So what's happened here is I'm looking at Sharon's shirt at, at defects, production defects, and I, and I say I've got loose threads. Now don't worry about these little numbers, you probably can't see them, I just wrote them there for my benefit so I don't have to stand here with a piece of paper. So actually over this period of time I had 2300 shirts that had loose threads. You've seen them, it's, it's shirt and it's got little threads hanging out, they need to be clipped, it didn't cause any problem, it just has to be taken care of. Uh, I had 1,650 shirts uh, where the hem, there was a problem with the hem. It had to be corrected, the, the hem around the bottom of the shirt. And, and then I had uh, 300 that had a flaw in the material of some kind. So what I've done is I've tracked these, I've counted these over time. <clears throat> then what I'm going to do is I'm going to chart, and these are the, you know, again, a typical, what? Bar chart. Frequency, category. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list my categories from the most to the least. So the first step is to take all that data, get a total of all the categories, and then organize it from most to least, and lay it on the chart as a bar. So there you can see my bars, you know, roughly 2300, 1650, 300, so you see the descending bars. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to create the Pareto line. And the Pareto line means I'm going to take the grand total of all defects, all right, and then <coughs> divide the 2300 by that, and what I find is that loose threads represent 46% of all my defects. All right, now here's where it gets just a little bit tricky. <coughs> Over here, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to divide <coughs> the, the 1650 by the total, I'm going to combine the two. So this category then is the total of the loose threads and the hems. It's, another, it's what we call a cumulative total. So now the total of these two together divided by the total number tells me that 79%. So what that's saying is this category right here generates 46% of all my defects. These two together account for 79% of all my defects. Now I come into here material, which is the third one down the line, and again I total all three of these cumulative total, divided by the grand total of defects, and lo and behold, I find that the three of these represent 85% of all my defects. So what the Pareto chart allows me to do is to see 
how these defects compare one to the other, a category to category, which is what the bar chart does, nice comparison. Then it strikes the Pareto line, which shows me the behavior or the trend of saying, all right, 40, if, I, if I do something about loose threads, I theoretically I'm going to address 46% of my defects. But if I can do something about loose threads and hams, then I'm going to accomplish uh, 79%. And so it just allows me to see what's going to happen and where I want to exercise or, or put my efforts. Remember, we don't have the resources to do everything, so you want to get the best bang for your buck. All right, <clears throat> but I'm not going to do just that chart. I'm now going to do a second Pareto chart on Sharon's. And what I've done here is I have, and this is the hard thing for most companies or industries, I have been able to associate a cost to each one of these defects. Every loose thread costs me $4 to fix. Every shirt that has a problem hem costs me $6 to fix, and every material flaw costs me $8 to fix. Now, these are just arbitrary numbers that I picked out of the air, but it gives you an idea. So I understand those costs. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the number of loose threads I have, multiply it by $4, and now I've got a number of $9,200 cost in repairing loose threads. Then I'm going to take the hems, multiply that by the total number of hems, which is $16.50, multiply that by the $6, and I've got uh, roughly nine, almost $10,000 worth of repair from hems. And I'm going to take the uh, material, which is eight bucks at a pop, and I've got about $2,400 in expense in hems. So now that I've got these cost totals, I'm going to again order them from most to least. And obviously you can see hems is costing me the most. I have more loose threads than I do hems, but hems is a more expensive item to fix. Then loose threads comes in, and then materials, and I'm going to do exactly the same thing, plot the costs as a bar, generate my Pareto line. So if I take care of hems, 38% of my repair costs are going to be impacted. If I can take care of these two together, 74% of the money I'm spending to repair defective material is going to hopefully go away and on down the line. <coughs> the issue here now is, which one, if I'm only going to be able to go after one, which one do I want to go after? And, and unfortunately, too many people jump to the conclusion it's going to be this one because of cost. And this is where the quality professional has to come in. This may not be an easy fix. It's not necessarily something I shouldn't go after, but it may take me quite a while to do it. What if I could fix this real quickly? Now granted, this doesn't give me as best bang for my buck on cost, but what if I could fix this within a week? And what if it took me a month to fix this? All right, now based on that time frame, which one would you go after first? Probably this guy, because it could do it right away. Once that's out of the way, then I could achieve that. So it's not that one chart's going to show you what to do. It's going to show you, and in this case, you've got, you've got some competing issues for number one. You now have to decide. And that's where you have to be able to understand the process and say, OK, what's it going to take to fix this versus what's going to take to fix that? And it becomes one of saying, OK, which one do I go after? Um, I worked with a, a furniture manufacturing company one summer <coughs> on the quality, and they had um, components that, that, they, that were painted, um, components, and they stacked them in a bin and, and then put them off into storage so they wanted to use them. And they were finding that some of the bins had scratches on, on the, uh, the panels. And, and so it was not a <coughs> high expense item. There weren't many that were scratched, and it wasn't too many. And we were looking at what should we go after first, and, and we had it on the list, and, and one of the, one of the um, Operators said, well, we can go after the scratches right off the bat. And I said, well, but that's kind of far down the list. And he said, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a 30 second fix. And uh, so we all said, okay, would you, would, you, might, would you prove that? And he said, sure. He said, here's what's happening. I, I understand the process. We, we fabricate these, we put them in a bin, the forklift picks them up and takes them over to another location to storage. If the bin is full, they don't shake and rattle around at all. But if the bin is only partially full, they joggle all over the place and scratch each other. And I said, OK, what's the five second fix? He said, real simple. He hauled out one of those little guns that's got the, uh, the plastic, you know, t uh, like saran wrap tape. He walked over to a bin that was partially full, made three passes around it, lashed them together with the plastic, and said, now you can move them and they won't scratch. So even though it wasn't a high dollar item, because we fixed it within a matter of about <laughs> five seconds, it became the number one target. So again, it takes the people who understand the process and who can identify what the corrective action may be to decide what to do. All right, over here I've got a dentist, everybody's favorite, Dr. Moore, painless. <coughs> 
So what he's done is Dr. Moore done a survey of his patients and he surveyed them on a variety of issues and the patients say, yeah, number one issue is pain. 60 people of the survey said, oh, the pain. Uh, then, then 35 people said, oh, it's the cost of the procedures. And, and 12 said, oh, it's the cleanliness. I have a problem with the cleanliness of the office or the exam rooms or whatever. So now we charted those. We put them in order. Uh, and then we uh, said, okay, 60 divided by the grand total of complaints means that pain was 40% of patient concerns. Total these two together, 95, 95 divided by the total number of complaints said 63%. Okay, these two together represent 63% of all complaints, and then these three together represent 71% of all complaints. So it's exactly the same as Sharon Schertz, it's complaints, there's a count of complaints. Now, we don't do a cost here, we can't do a cost here, but this is one of those unique things where we can apply what's called a weighted average. So what Dr. Moore did is he came in and he looked at this and he said, you know, I have some factors that uh, are critical and some that are major. And he provided a weighting factor. He said, if I deem something as critical, then I'm going to take the count and multiply it by 30, because that's critical. And if I've got something that has a major, is a major issue, I'll multiply it by five. And then if I have something that's not significant, maybe I only use a, a weighted factor of one, it stays at its actual count. So he goes through and he now generates weighted totals. And as he did this, when he applied the weighting to it, look here, clean popped up as number one. Why? Infection, you know, pa patient problems. So Dr. Moore says, sure, not too many of them complain about clean, but clean is a much bigger issue than pain. Yeah, sure, you don't want the pain, but you certainly don't want the pain you're gonna have if you get an infection from the process, so cleanliness is a critical issue. He's applied his factors to that and look what happens. Clean comes out as number one, pain comes as number two, and lo and behold, something we didn't even see on this one, professionalism comes in as number three. And we chart them the same way we did before, and they say the clean is 31%, the two clean and pain together represent 57%, and 73, cost is not an issue in the weighted. So, again, you now have the two comparative charts. What are you going to go after? Well, again, it takes a person who understands the process and the procedure and they decide what will be the one that they will, they will uh, attempt to impact first. I have one other thing I want to show you real quickly because sometimes you'll see these charts a little differently. This is the way I like to see them. I like to see them with the bars and then I like to see the numbers, the Pareto line coming out of the top bar and the number, the percentage is shown on the Pareto line. It makes it a lot easier for me to read and I think it's a better chart. There is a more, another way you're going to see these. Again, you'll have your standard chart, but what's going to happen is over here, you're going to have your frequency numbers. Down here, you're going to have your categories. And over here, you're going to have your percentages. So you'll see the categories expressed just like you've seen them in the other Pareto charts. And they'll trace back to these lines. But then what you're going to see is you're going to see the Pareto line actually come in here and you read the Pareto line off of the second y-axis. It's, it's, a, it's a charting style that's easily done in um, Excel or any of the packages. It simply allows you to have a second y-axis. So this data set applies to the primary y-axis, which is frequency. The data that represents this, and you still have to have your, you know, what you do is you have to get your uh, cumulative total to calculate your percentages, and then your actual percentages are plotted against a second y-axis that shows the percentages. I find this a little more difficult to read uh, th than this style. Um, but I wanted to show it to you because you will see, in many cases, this style print. That's the traditional. This is the non-traditional. Um, but like I said, I, th I think this is a little more uh, self-explanatory.